Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is wonderful to have you with us today. Uh, and a good afternoon and a good evening to our friends and colleagues elsewhere around the world. <clears throat> My name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And on behalf of Brookings and our John L. Thornton Center, or China Center, I'd like to begin by offering my profound thanks to this distinguished group of leading public health experts for joining this important discussion today. We will use our time together to look at the public health experiences and lessons learned in the fight against COVID-19 in Asia, and then examine where the world may be heading in its fight against the spread of this virus. I'm pleased to be joined by so many renowned public health from China and Japan, Singapore and South Korea, the strong participation in this event, including with an audience of individuals from around the world, is reflective of the collective spirit that it will take to overcome this disease. Given both the increasing spread of COVID-19 and the importance of relations between the United States and Asia today, this meeting, even in virtual form, is vitally important. Today's webinar seeks to address three fundamental questions. At an epidemiological level, how does COVID-19 differ from SARS, MERS, and Ebola uh, epidemics, as well as other flus, and how should that temper our response? Uh, number two, what, what response has worked well in each country, and what hasn't? And third, how should the United States and other countries prepare for what's to come during the outbreak in the aftermath, which we anticipate? Our goal is to identify practical, actionable recommendations that can help governments in the, and in the United States and around the world improve their ability to save lives and to stop the spread of this virus. To help guide today's discussion, I'd like to propose what we'll call the 4R for our conceptual structure. In other words, response, recovery, reform, and renewal. What is the urgency of our response? How do we collaborate in recovery? And in recovery, how do we seek to reform those things that need to be changed? And how do we renew relationships and institutions to prepare them for the future, the four R's? All of these segments in combination can set the world on a different, more hopeful course. Even if governments do not seem able right now to coordinate or to cooperate on COVID-19 in response, this does not mean that we should abandon hope and it doesn't mean we can't move forward as people. In a crisis that has seen responses veer from minimizing the seriousness of the epidemic to overstating its threat, Today's discussion will present a clear-eyed and balanced estimation of the real challenges we're facing as a community, community of peoples and a community of nations. Each of today's panelists have had to confront real-life questions about what an effective response to COVID-19 should look like, look like at a governmental level, at a societal level, and at a medical professional level, and often all of those simultaneously. I want to encourage all of our panelists to explore specific lessons learned from this pandemic and point to ways that may be helpful in fighting it going forward. I also want to underscore the immense challenge, but also the opportunity that this crisis presents. We have not seen such an, a, a devastating pandemic on a global level since 1918, but unlike in 1918, we now have the capability to rapidly and effectively exchange knowledge and information and coordinate across borders and to share relationships as people if we choose to do so. If we take this opportunity to, co to cooperate and to coordinate rather than to blame shift or close ourselves off to information, we have the chance to come out stronger. We have the chance to be a stronger world through international cooperation against smallpox, malaria, HIV and other diseases. I strongly believe that at this critical moment, it's most important for us to look forward to finding solutions 
instead of looking backward in search of scapegoats. Our future, our collective future, will be defined by how we treat others, whether we come together, at, and how we come together at this perilous time. And as president of the Brookings Institution, I am determined to focus the collective capacity of this institution on generating big ideas for building a stronger future. And today's event is an important element in that effort. So again, I wanna thank you very much for joining us. This is a critical moment and all of us are in this together. So with that, let me also then invite to the microphone our interim vice president and the director of our foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution, Dr. Suzanne Maloney, who will introduce our first panel. Suzanne, over to you, please. Good morning. I hope you can hear me. My name is Suzanne Maloney, and I'm the Interim Vice President and Director of the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. I'm honored and humbled to be joined by such a prestigious group of participants from many different time zones to join in conversation about the most important issue of our time, which is how to defeat our common global enemy of COVID-19. I would like to thank our staff and scholars in the Brookings China Center under the direction of Chung Li for its foresight in arranging this webinar. In addition to my management responsibilities at Brookings, I study Iran, which is one of the countries that has been hardest hit by this virus. Given the experience in Iran and elsewhere in the world, I know that the experiences and lessons we hear today from our esteemed friends in Asia will not only serve to inform us in the United States, but their advice has the potential to help leaders everywhere, especially in those countries that have not yet felt the worst impact of the virus and still have time to prepare and to flatten the curve. I want to be clear that today's webinar is not politically motivated. Our purpose here is not to highlight some countries or political systems as having done a better or worse job than others in combating this crisis, but rather to build on our common humanity and uncover best practices that can be shared with others in need. In short, the ultimate objective of this webinar is to save lives and to stop the spread of the virus. In this first panel, we will hear from experts in Asia, namely China, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, who were among the first to confront this disease, each taking different measures with various levels of effectiveness. They will share the experiences and lessons they have learned that can be applied elsewhere. I now turn to my colleague and co-moderator, our Michael H. Armacost Chair and Fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center at Brookings to introduce our panelists. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, John, for your framing remarks. Uh, our first panel will be comprised of three components. I will ask each speaker to make brief opening interventions. Suzanne and I will ask each speaker several follow-up questions from their presentations. And then we will open up the floor to questions from our global audience. We will be accepting questions from our audience throughout the event, which can be submitted by emailing to events at brookings.edu or by sending a direct message to our Twitter account at Brookings China. In the interest of time, I will be ruthlessly efficient in my introduction to each speaker, but their full biographies are available on the website for this event if you would like to know more about their backgrounds. We will start our presentations with a intervention by Dr. Sunmin Kwan, who is a professor and former Dean of the School of Public Health at Seoul National University in Korea. He is the founding director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Health Systems and Financing. He has kept close tabs on the outbreak of COVID-19 in South Korea, and will be able to share his perspective from there. Over to you, Dr. Kwan. Thank you. Um... I'm an economist, and so I'd like to comment on three major issues uh, from a policy perspective 
that, uh, that I observed from the Korean uh, Korean government or Korean responses to, to this COVID. Those three are mainly governance issues. And then another very important component is mass testing. And number three, contact tracing. I think these, these three components issues are closely interconnected. And as a result, so far, I mean, I know I understand it's too, a bit too early to say this, but so far we has we seem to manage it, the slow down, the rapid uh, increase in infections without a major lockdowns. So let me comment those three elements one by one. I think the first one is the governance issues, governance uh, trust in the government, a trust among society or transparency is quite important, especially uh, in this type of pandemic emergency situation. And also there is a policy learning component in the context of Korea, because about five years ago, Korea had a painful experience of MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And at that time, Korea experienced a, one of the largest casualties outside of Middle East. So after that, government uh, recognizes the importance of the preparedness to this type of health security issues. So Korean Center for Disease Control was strengthened a lot. So this uh, in this COVID uh, crisis, every day, I mean, at the beginning, twice per day, there is a briefing by headed by the deputy minister, sometimes the minister of health and the director of the Korean Center for Disease Control. They gave a very detailed statistics on, on the, how many patients from which areas, and then there is also a, a mess like a social campaign and, and people seem to uh, quite well complied with this uh, government recommendations without any enforcement issues. So people wear, all people wear masks in the public place and, and, and there's a kind of social pressure such that if you don't wear a mask in the public place, people, you can, you can feel the pressure that people are staring at you. Why, why you don't have to wear a mask? And people voluntarily uh, cancel uh, 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 meetings. So even if the restaurants are all still open, no lockdowns, but um, there's overall uh, compliance with this social, social distancing strongly recommended by the government. And this, this governance issue is accompanied by a very rapid, very early and mass scale of testing. Okay, I mean, at, the, at the beginning, I think uh, around the world, there might be some um, discussions whether mass scale testing is needed or not. But it, it turns out that, that this COVID-19 uh, is, is very rapidly, uh, you know, you know in, infecting others. So it turns out that the mass scale of testing is a quite effective mechanism to find the cases, isolate the cases, and treat the infected people. So, and also it's, it's quite uh, uh, impressive that even around the end of January, at that time, there are only like less than 10 cases in Korea, but government talked with the industry and government provided fast track approval for the production of test kits. So because of that, we didn't experience any kind of shortage of test kits. It's a huge uh, mass production of, of test kits, but it, it very soon it became obvious what happens to this large number of cases because with mass testing, there are a huge increase in, in the number of, tests, in the number of uh, uh, positive cases. So at the beginning, uh, people, all the positive cases were hospitalized. And then we realized that then we don't have enough beds. So then uh, we started to allocate beds based on the severity of, of uh, the cases. So if the case, if we, we see a very severe COVID patient, they are hospitalized. But if for the milder cases, they are, they are, they are staying, 
it a government designated facilities. I mean, it's kind of a residential or, or training facilities used by large corporations or government public enterprise, but it was converted into a residential facilities and they are staying there, but, but they, are, they are monitored by doctors for this milder patient. And another interesting case is that um, at the very beginning, uh, there are some cases of infection of the test areas, testing stations in a hospital. So when the testing station is infected, sometimes we had to close the hospital, whole, 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 whole building. So then there's some, some innovations and uh, in, in invention of so-called drive-through testings. So around the uh, nation, there are many drive-through testing stations are uh, introduced as a mass scale of testing. And uh, another very important uh, and a bit controversial issue, especially from a, a Europe or American perspective is the very extensive and sometimes very aggressive tracing of contacts. So one of the uh, reasons that Korea so far did not have any major lockdowns is that whenever there's a positive cases, there's a very aggressive tracing of contacts. So, what, which kind, what shops, restaurants was visited and what type of transportation was used. So, and this type of information was gathered and disseminated by the government. So for me, like every day I, I got text messages sent by my district government. So today we have found this case and this patient visited these this areas around this is in time. So if you happen to be around that area, that time, please go to the testing station and get tested. So, because uh, as you know, there's a huge social economic cost of lockdowns. So I think we have a choice. Option one, okay, complete lockdowns and we don't have to worry about the privacy issues. Another option Korea took so far is that no lockdowns, but very extensive tracing. I mean, Korea is almost like a cashless society. People purchase even the Starbucks coffee with credit card. All the public transportation, almost 100% people use credit card for the transportation. So you can, so when you use, when you check the credit card, you can easily find, I mean, where, where it was visited and what type of transportation. But in the, especially in, in Korea, uh, there's little controversy on this type of uh, uh, tracing of contracts, especially because it, about five years ago, around the time of the MERS crisis, uh, there's a strong public support request that we should use this type of uh, active tracing of contracts. But I fully understand that it might not be acceptable in, in some countries. So it should be, this kind of contact tracing should be based on a social consensus especially in a democratic society. But so far in Korea, a very minority of people uh, question the privacy issues in this type of contact tracing. But there's a very, uh, uh, this is very popular policy in a sense. Uh, you know, public. I think that's those three, as I said, governance, trust, accountability, plus very early, uh, and mass scale of testing, plus uh, aggressive tracing of context. I think that was that is a major features of the health policy for for COVID nineteen in, in in the case of Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. That was fascinating. Uh, we will next uh, move to Singapore where we will ask Dr. Vernon Lee to provide a perspective. Dr. Lee is the Director for Communicable Diseases in the Singapore Ministry of Health and Head of Singapore Armed Forces Biodefense Center. He has overseen much of Singapore's efforts in combating and preventing the outbreak of COVID-19 in the country. Dr. Lee, over to you.
just to show um, a little epi curve of Singapore's outbreak. And you can see that initially uh, we had some imported cases, uh, mostly from uh, Wuhan city and uh, Hubei province in China that had seeded uh, some local transmission um, in the later part of January and February of 2020. Um, and, and that was actually kept well under control by a um, strict regime which we had put in, um, which comprised of a comprehensive uh, testing strategy. So essentially we tested as many uh, sort of suspect cases as possible. And for every case that we detected, um, we performed active case finding around that case through contact tracing. And we tested more individuals to, to uncover every single case that we could find. For all these cases, they were isolated in hospital. And for the other close contacts who were, um, were well, we quarantined them for um, two weeks and monitored their health. And if they were um, shown symptoms, we would then admit them to hospital for additional testing. So with that, we managed to uh, ring fans and contain um, the outbreak uh, relatively well. Now, fast forward to uh, March, and this is where we had a lot of returning, uh, mostly residents uh, from countries across the world. There was no single country um, where, you know, re received cases from. They were really occurring um, all around the world and, and quite in line with the global spread of, yeah, of uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> and with this new um, sort of wave of imported cases, they en ended up seeding quite a bit of local transmission. So you can see that there were quite a lot of uh, local, both linked and unlinked cases signifying some community um, spread. Although a number of cases are still relatively low compared to many other countries, that is cause for concern. We are still performing active case finding, and contact tracing and quarantine around every single case. So um, on my next slide, you can see that um, on the left, the time to isolation or quarantine for an individual makes a big difference on the number of secondary cases that um, every case will generate. So the earlier you isolate the case or you quarantine um, contacts, you reduce the opportunity of spread. And you can see on the right, um, we have shown that our method has been quite effective in bringing down the time from isolation to quarantine from about eight or nine days initially uh, round to about two to four days um, at this present moment. And this is because of a lot of testing, a lot of awareness uh, among healthcare providers. And, and we have changed our case definition and surveillance um, definitions across time to adapt to the changing uh, you know, uh, epidemic and epidemiology. These are three curves um, showing the effective reproduction number across time in Singapore. So whether you look at the imported cases on the left, local link cases in the center, or um, local unlinked cases on the right, you can see that we have managed to keep the reproduction uh, number below one for most of the time, save for a few blips when uh, there was transmission due to several clusters. You can see that the majority of cases actually did not transmit to anyone else. So about 70 to 80% did not transmit to anyone else. And this is due to um, early quarantine or isolation of those individuals. Uh, but unfortunately, some individuals do transmit um, to many secondary cases due to either their late detection or because they had uh, either gone to work or to social activities uh, while they were ill. But overall, we have managed to keep the uh, reproductive number below one, which is what uh, will take to reduce uh, the outbreak and the force of infection. Now, of course, this excludes the number of cases that we are importing or that we had imported um, into Singapore. So this is a, something that we have to address moving forward. Um, the other thing that we are, of course, concerned about is pre-symptomatic transmission. And this is some graphs uh, from um, an article that we had just published in uh, the US CDC journal uh, MMWR um, showing that pre-symptomatic transmission had been detected across several clusters. So this means that um, the, you know, uh, in addition to sort of contact tracing, quarantine of individuals, some form of physical distancing and reduction of contact between individuals is also important in trying to control this uh, epidemic. And finally, um, coming to the actual measures that we have rolled out in Singapore. So our measures are based on 
um, sort of risk calibrated uh, policies that are commensurate and proportional to the actual risk that we are facing. So as a baseline, what we have done, and, and we think that this is sustainable for long periods and will very well be the new normal, is to encourage individuals to have good personal hygiene and to be socially responsible to stay at home when unwell. So these are educational messages that we have put out to the public to empower them to do something, which is to take care of their personal hygiene and their own health and to protect others, including their family and their loved ones. Now, between that and the other um, sort of policies which um, increase in terms of the reduction in the reproductive number, but of course are more disruptive, it depends on the situation that we're facing, the number of cases, uh, what we anticipate the cases will look like over the next few weeks, and we have rolled out um, these measures um, in, in response to that. Now, we always try to stay ahead of the curve or ahead of the virus in Singapore. So instead of responding or reacting to the current available information, which unfortunately is always a lag. So by the time you see cases appearing today, they were actually last week's cases. So we, we have worked with modelers um, and other experts to try to project what might happen over the next couple of weeks if we do not do anything. And therefore, a lot of our actions are anticipatory um, in advance of what might be um, happening in the few sort of coming weeks. So we have moved, uh, for example, to initially capping the size of events, telecommuting, enhanced measures for vulnerable groups such as the elderly, to subsequently suspension of events and entertainment and limiting the size of gatherings to 10 or less people. And this is really to, to slow the pace of spread, preventing large clusters, and also to prevent the accelerated spread of disease. But now because we are detecting more clusters and are concerned about a sort of further spread, we have in fact today just announced that we will now do home-based learning for schools for the next, um, over the next month. And we'll also um, allow only essential service, uh, essential work to continue while encouraging businesses to perform telecommuting. Now, this is not in response to any widespread community transmission in Singapore at this point, but we think that due to the large number of imports that we have uh, received and the growing um, sort of outbreak, we think that this will help to bring the number of cases down substantially um, as shown by the r not earlier. And then we can balance that by sort of moving between these um, different policies in response to the situation. So it's almost like a dance where we move across the different policies um, across time. And we think that by doing this, it will be sustainable because this certainly is not a sprint over the next month. It's a marathon that we do not know how long it will last. So this is something that we think will be sustainable, not just for the healthcare system to, to avoid any sort of a resources issues, but also to allow for society and the economy to have that sort of balance. Because if you do too little, the virus will overtake you very quickly. But if you do too much, then the, the cure might be more deadly than the virus itself. So we try to do this um, sort of balance to be proportional and in response to the actual risk. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Uh, we would now like to turn to Dr. Kenji Shibuya, who is the professor and chair of global health policy at the University of Tokyo's Graduate School of Medicine. He is also the president of Japan's Institute for Global Health. He has analyzed the course of COVID-19's outbreak in Japan and published a paper recently in The Lancet, analyzing the resilience of high-performing health systems such as Japan's against COVID-19. Dr. Shibuya, over to you. Thanks very much. Um, actually, I moved to London and I'm kind of working at the King's College of London. But um, so um, today and yesterday, Japan is in the situation of you know, discussing whether we should implement lockdown right now because Japan, Tokyo situation is very becoming very close to that in New York two weeks ago. So we are in the middle of a heated debate right now. But let me just share with you uh, three major lessons from Japanese experiences in, in terms of COVID. One is, um, as you know, two previous speakers mentioned, 
I think it's possible to contain the outbreak, at least in the short term, with the very basic strategy, that is test and isolate. So very basic strategy did work, in, at least in the short run. But in the long run, it may be very tough. It becomes a trade-off between social, economic, and the political um, element versus health impact. So, uh, you know, the containment could be easily damaged by politics and policies, both domestically and globally. So without concerted effort, uh, it is not necessarily sustainable. Now, finally, I think uh, it is extremely important to share information and joint learning process as we are doing right now. It is extremely vital to share lessons. So let me just start from Japanese experience in the early phase. So we published our colleagues with uh, in Singapore, Hong Kong, about the resilience of health systems in high performing uh, health system countries. And we identify three major issues out of this. So initially, you know, three countries did very well in terms of test and isolate and focusing on clusters of infected people. But I, I think three major lessons from these um, uh, early phase experiences is uh, threefold. First is that the integration of services in the health system and of course other sector amplify the ability to absorb and adapt the shock. The second is the spread of fake news and misinformation constitutes a major and resolvable challenge. And thirdly and finally, the trust of patient, healthcare professionals and the society as a whole in government is of paramount importance for meeting health care crisis. So that was still ongoing, but uh, you know, after the first phase, uh, Japan didn't do well, particularly uh, on the uh, huge cruise ship Diamond Princess instance, which was a really, really kind of disaster because uh, you know, 4,000 uh, crew members and passengers, and it was quite uh, chaotic. But if we look at the, what Japan did in terms of domestic um, infection control, at the beginning, as uh, Singapore did, and of course, uh, South Korea did, we are primarily focusing on the cluster-based approach, basically test and isolate. But what we didn't do well was um, we didn't expand the test capacity as much as we could, as you know, suggested by Suman. And you know, testing capacity was not enough to test all the suspect cases. Uh, we primarily focused on the cluster-based approach, and which was quite successful on the ground. But up to some extent, of course, it is extremely difficult to identify undetected cases. So until a couple of weeks ago, uh, Japan remained, the, the cases, reported cases in Japan remain low. And people are really puzzled by that. But there are two possible explanations. One is Japan did well, actually focusing on clusters and basically test and isolate. But the other explanation is that uh, there were cases which were not detected because of limited testing capacity. And both are reasonable. And I predicted that Japan will soon, would soon see the explosion uh, from the undetected cases. And that is happening right now. And if, you know, test and isolate strategy is a very classic, basic, fundamental public health approach. And I think WHO has been advocating from the beginning, right? But some, I don't know why, but many countries didn't follow and or even ignore and follow the, their own uh, policy interventions. For example, uh, because we are constrained by the Tokyo Olympics um, until uh, the end of the last month. And you know, Prime Minister Abe, all of a sudden, the cabinet decided to uh, close all the schools, even at the very early phase of the pandemic outbreak in Japan, because there are very mm, few cases among kids. And we are doing well on the cluster-based approach. Yeah. But all of a sudden, prison went for that kind of symbolic, visible, uh, very hard intervention. Then after 
a few months, um, the expert panel suggested to lift it, even though the outbreak was um, you know, kind of expanding. So that kind of conflicting message from the policymakers expert uh, was very confusing. And right now, um, the, you know, both expert and MPs, particularly Tokyo governor, is asking the uh, prime minister to announce the state of emergency right now. Otherwise, we will see the explosion. But still, there is a tension between Tokyo governor and the prime minister, partly because you know, their you know, incentive is slightly different. So the cabinet is focusing more on the social economic turmoil. On the other, Tokyo governor uh, you know, requested by the Japan Medical Association and Tokyo Medical Association on the potential crops or the healthcare. So as Suman clearly mentioned, there is clearly a trade-off. And in the short run, we can just lock down for a couple of weeks and they lift it and they go, go back to another lockdown. We could continue a while, while, but afterward, in the long run, it's quite tough. So we need to adopt some sort of new social system and a way to accommodate, adopt, or renew, or as you mentioned, first mentioned, reform our social and health and economic system. We really need to adopt to ourselves to the new social system. So that will be clearly the next step. You know, right now we are focusing on tackling the pandemic or clusters or uh, isolate the patient. And of course we need to prevent the crafts of health systems. But given this uh, you know, pandemic phase, I don't know how long it will take for the next couple of years. And uh, so we may need to seek the exit strategy and then also think about to adopt a new health and social economic systems, not just domestically, but also globally. And on that, we need to seriously look at, you know, um, some leading agency concerted efforts globally, because right now, even in Japan, uh, lots of policymakers are, are criticized WHO. You know, some mentioned that we are, you know, we are easy get caught by scapegoating somebody, but that's not helpful because WHO and other nation states are part of the solution. So I think it's the time to go back to basics and to reinvigorate the global concerted effort. Or even though now, right now, or each member state, each countries, uh, you of course have to tackle their own you know, outbreaks. But inevitably we may need to go back to the basics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shibuya. Uh, appreciated the candor of your comments. Uh, we will now turn to Dr. Shui Lan, who is the Chong Kong Chair, Distinguished Professor, and Dean of the Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. He has been analyzing challenges presented by COVID-19 outbreak in China and strategies and the efficacy of Chinese policies in the public health response. Dr. Shui Lan, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Let me share the screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to just to, uh, first of all, just to give a very brief overview of China's response to COVID-19, and then I'll have some general reflections on how uh, to, in a way to, to review, uh, you know, the, the challenges in, in managing uh, this crisis. Uh, I think, of course, I think we all know that it started in, in Wuhan, uh, China. So I think the first stage, I think, in, in China's response is to really make sense of, of the, the, the risk. I think they started from the identifying the risk and trying to make sense of it. 
uh, I think that we you know, we now know that actually the uh, 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 you know the uh, in early December uh, the uh, the first case actually was uh, went to the, the the patient went to the hospital, and then I think the on December the twenty seventh, uh, Dr. Zhang Jixian reported the case through the uh, the uh, infectious uh, disease, disease control system. So Wuhan began to conduct investigation. I think on the second stage of, you know, in this making sense is, is actually, I think that was uh, partly was, you know, led by the, uh, the, the cover up of the local uh, um, health authority. And partly also, I think uh, was the uh, not as rigorous as, you know, possible, the, the, the process of investigating the cases that led to the wrong uh, judgment that uh, the human to human transmission was, you know, either no cases or low probabilities. I think only by January the 20th, uh, then I think the, uh, the third group of the, uh, the, the high level expert committee and they, uh, you know, actually they found indeed actually uh, there was human to human transmission. And so I think that um, uh, that was publicly, uh, you know, uh, confirmed uh, at a TV interview uh, and then I think that there was national, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, action. State Council enacted the law on infectious disease for COVID-19, and National Health Commission began to publicly announce the, the new cases. I think the uh, the Hubei also initiated level two public health emergency response, uh, and Wuhan announced the lockdown of the city and began to respond to the increasing number of in infected patients. So this, you know, in a way, it's a very hasty response, uh, uh, you know, from the January the twentieth to the early the early February. I think I, I, you know, some of my colleagues have already mentioned that indeed testing and isolation is a critical uh, uh, step. However, testing uh, at early stage became a bottleneck, and also, of course, I think because of the the surge of the uh, patients, medical beds also became uh, limited. And so actually a lot of the patients with, or, or the, the people who are suspicious of them, themselves, uh, you know, being uh, infected, they rushed to try to get tested. And I, actually that's, uh, that act itself have further exasperated the, the situation. Uh, so actually many people may have been infected through the mingling with those actually being uh, infected. So this is a, a, a quite a, 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 a hasty uh, a response. The third state is the national mobilization. I think actually the um, response outside Wuhan was very quick. I think the uh, three provinces initiated level one, the highest public health emergency response on January the 23rd, the, the same day when uh, Wuhan announced its lockdown. Also the central government you know, set up a leading group on January the 25th and also established a joint containment and control working mechanism. And very quickly, 31 provinces started level one response for public health events. And also I think the uh, National Health Commission also uh, published seven editions of the, uh, you know, COVID-19 containment, uh, uh, you know, the treatment uh, plan and also six edition of control work plan. And also there's a national mobilization of medical doctors and nurses nationwide to support Wuhan and Hubei. At its peak, there were over 40,000 medical professionals from all over the country to, you know, working in Hubei. Uh, and of course, also there's a national mob uh, mobilization uh, to meet the uh, surge demand for masks and other medical supplies and equipment. So this third stage is really a national mobilization to try to uh, contain the, the, the virus. I think these are some of the strategies that, that was uh, uh, you know, uh, adopted by various local government and also the central government to, um, to contain the spread of the virus. The fourth state is really sort of balancing act. I think this started in, in late April until now. I think that, um, first of all, I think started on April, uh, February the 23rd. There's a national televised meeting 
uh, with Xi Jinping and all the top national leaders attending the meeting, along with 170,000 local government officials. This is the first event of its kind. I think basically at this meeting that there was, uh, a, you know, the, the government uh, basically felt there was a, 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 um, a good control of the spread and then began to shift the strategy to a more sort of balancing act between the containment of the COVID-19 and also trying to uh, resume economic and social activities. So that's sort of one set of sort of balancing act. I think most recently, I think there's another balancing act, uh, you know, being between how to control the resurgence of the COVID-19 locally, but also to uh, control the importation of cases from overseas. So what are the challenges in, in managing a crisis like this one? <coughs> the first one is how to make sense of the potential risks. I think this, uh, you know, the COVID-19 is a sort of really so novel uh, virus that actually early on, I think there was really, uh, you know, um, some, you know, difficult to judge its behavior and so on. So I think that sort of led to the mistakes that we, we saw. Uh, so I think that um, that state is always, I think, a, a very challenging in, 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 in situations like this. And, and the second one is how to make decisions with great uncertainties. I think many of my colleagues have already said that we do have some, you know, very effective strategies to contain the spread of the virus, but at the same time that may entail very huge uh, economic and, and social costs. So particularly when you are not quite sure of the uh, behavior of the virus and uh, you know, uh, uh, how, um, uh, you know, how to make those decisions uh, are not easy. And the third is that um, at, at least from what uh, you know, these various studies we've seen, the best way is to move ahead of the curve. Uh, you know, so, so actually that to avoid uh, you know, to to uh, um, uh, you know to to, to avoid the 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 the, uh, the, the peak, uh, you know, the, the the high peak of the uh, the the, uh, the 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 infected uh, cases. Uh, but here, I think that um, it may not easy to uh, to do that because I think the general public may not see that the the need for that. <coughs> so the general public's uh, trust and cooperation. Is very critical. The next one is how to mobilize surge capacity to meet the peak demand. I think, you know, when you have a crisis like this, there's always a special need for certain kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources. So how to to mobilize the resources to meet the demand? I think that's really a, a critical um, challenge. Mm -hmm. So here, the scale really matters. The next one is how to synchronize policies in different regions in, in a big country like China. I think here, I think that of course, the uh, uh, central government always you know, wanted to have a policy that can be implemented nationwide. But at the same time, how, do, how, how can you allow different regions to have varied policy, but also synchronize policies to reduce the potential uh, cost? So that's sort of the challenge we, you know, we face. I think now if we look, you know, using those kind of, a, you know, a, a, a measures to look at what China did, I think first of all, I think on the how to make sense of the risks, I think the Chinese public health system failed to recognize the risk fast enough to contain the virus. Uh, so I think that there's, a, you know, a, a very vibrant discussion about the weakness in, in Chinese public health system and the uh, how uh, to remedy it, and as, as what uh, uh, John Allen, uh, you know, uh, has mentioned at the early, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the opening of, of, of this uh, discussion. The second is how to make decisions with great uncertainties. I think here the central government has acted very decisively and very quickly to, to mobilize the, you know, the the whole country to respond. So I think that the decision was made uh, uh, very quickly. The third is how to make moves ahead of the curve. Uh, I think here that uh, one can say that, uh, uh, you know, I think the most recent study have shown that 
with Wuhan's lockdown, uh, it's, it's you, you can see that actually, uh, you know, the, with lockdown and also with level one response, you know, the the lowest curve, the that that uh, uh, black curve, was the one that actually the outcome. But without that, uh, without shutdown and without level one response, the the red line would would be the case. So that would have been uh, much uh, worse than what we have now. So I think that uh, in a way we can say that um, uh, you know China partially in a way was luck, uh, uh, lucky because the, it's a spring uh, festival holiday. So the uh, the lockdown actually you know and and also uh, in, in Wuhan and also I think the uh, the kind of a, a, a uh, you know, uh, policy measures taken to uh, contain the virus was able to to do that. I think was uh, you know the timing was also important. Another thing is also the general public are quite cooperative, you know, in 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 uh, following the measure. Uh, I was really almost so laughing at my Korean colleagues about the masks. I also had the similar uh, things that you know, particularly in open space. Sometimes I don't want to. Wear the masks, and you know the uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, you know people around, and they would often, you know, uh, uh, tell me to to wear masks. So I think that the general public are quite, uh, you know, cooperative in in those uh, in following the, the policies. And in terms of how to synchronize policies in different regions, I think China's this time is, uh, has done a much better job compared to the uh, last time when uh, that H one N one. I think there is. Um, um, uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, stiff policy, and now I think this is a, a much more agile uh, policy. And finally, in terms of how to mobilize surge capacity to meet the uh, peak demand, I think you know at early stage it's it's very challenging in 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 in, in doing that. But I think later on, I think that was indeed was able to meet the demand. So I think that's a more uh, a brief overview and uh, reflection of the situation. Thank you. Dr. Trayvon, thank you very much for uh, for your overview, for your reflections, and uh, for your candor about uh, some of the experiences and lessons that are being learned. Uh, we're, we're truly grateful for, for your comments. Um, you provided a perspective from Beijing. I would like to now ask Dr. Zheng Junhua to provide a perspective from the front lines. Um, Dr. Jun, Zheng Junhua recently returned to Shanghai after 68 days and nights uh, in Hubei province, where he was part of a team that worked on the front lines battling the pandemic. Um, he also is the vice director of Shanghai General Hospital, affiliated to Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Um, he and his team uh, have, have performed uh, a lot of work over an extended period of time. Uh, he will provide a presentation and he will also have some comments that may be uh, interpreted consecutively by translation. Dr. Zheng, over to you. Thank you. For my PowerPoint, can be on. Distinguished professors, good afternoon, China. Good morning, America. At the critical moment of the global fight against novel coronavirus pneumonia, I would like to participate in a discussion meeting on how Asian countries control the novel coronavirus pneumonia network sponsored by the China Center of the Brookings Institution and share the experiences and summaries from all in China next. I will briefly introduce the situation of our medical team. The first batch of medical teams in Shanghai are composed of 135 people from 52 units, with 37 doctors, 93 nurses, and five hospital flu. He arrived in Wuhan at 1.30 a.m. on January 25th. The first of the national medical team to arrive in Wuhan on the afternoon of January 25th. He entered Wuhan Jingyantan Hospital to take over the work of the second and third floor. On 
March 13th, 2020. JAMA Internal Medicine. A well-known international medical journal. Published online a joint clinical analysis of JAMA Internal Medicine by the first batch of Shanghai medical teams led by Professor Zhang Jiongholong Hola and Professor Song Yuhalin of Wu and Jin Yutan Hospital and Chongshan Hospital affiliated to Fudan University. This study reveals the risk factors for the development of acute respiratory distress syndrome ARD. Studies have reported the clinical features of CODI Day 19, for example. Juan et al. first reported that the common clinical manifestations of CODI D19 patients included fever, myalgia, or fatigue. And dry cough current clinical practice suggests that most patients have a good prognosis. But older patients and patients with chronic underlying disease are more likely to have a poor prognosis subsequently. Shin et al. The study highlights that advanced age is associated with an increased risk of developing ARDS and of progressing from ARDS to death. It was also found that although high fever was associated with the development of ARDS, it was associated with a reduced risk of death in patients with ARDS. The study also found that among patients with ARDS, 23, 46.0% of 50 patients who received methylprednisolone died, compared with 21, 61.8% of 34 patients who did not receive methylprednisolone, preliminarily suggesting that methylprednisolone may be associated with a lower risk of death from ARDS. The study highlights that advanced age is associated with an increased risk of developing ARDS and of progressing from ARDS to death. It was also found that although high fever was associated with the development of ARDS, it was associated with a reduced risk of death in patients with ARDS. Lead author Dr. Chao Min Wu from the Shanghai Medical Team said, this study has received a lot of attention from international colleagues, with at 134,750 of reading times a week. Thank you. It was closed. Hello, it appears that we have uh, lost uh, Dr. Jung's presentation uh, at the moment. Um, so with that, I, I think we will move into the question phase and I will uh, turn it over to Suzanne. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you, uh, my profound thanks to all of the panelists that we've heard from today. Uh, your remarks are so important and so informative. And I look forward to carrying on a discussion uh, over the course of the next few moments and then turning to our audience for uh, some questions as well. Let me start, start with you, Dr. Kwan. Uh, South Korea's approach to tackling COVID-19 has been lauded as one of the quickest and most effective responses to the pandemic. As one of the earliest nations outside of China to be impacted by the novel coronavirus, how was South Korea able to be prepared so quickly? You talked a little bit in your presentation about past experiences. I'm wondering if that was a major factor and if there are other factors that you might point to in devising such an effective approach. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, that the policy learning from the past failure, I mean, failure for, of MERS uh, crisis was a very important factor. I mean, from my view as a policy person, because uh, at, at, at that time, it was a shocking failure in, within Korea. And there are a lot of uh, uh, discussions and criticism. Criti I mean, current government, 
at that time was the opposition party. So at that, that, that time, the opposition party heavily criticized that government. And now this government, it's a, that, that opposition party becomes the current government. So I think this government is a, a bit, I mean, more progressive than the previous one. And this government has more keen in the overall health and social policy compared to the previous one and learning from the past, as I mentioned, failure of MERS. So they, they moved very quickly. So I think that's a very important factor in terms of a policy learning perspective, learning from the past. But also there's like a tested learning. We call policies some kind of learning by doing and tested learning. So in that perspective, also like innovative, uh, innovate some kind of innovations in terms of, uh, of uh, drive-through testings uh, uh, from the experience or learning by doing aspects. Yeah, that's my short response. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Dr. Lee, turning to you, would you speak for a few moments about the biggest challenge that Singapore has faced and how you might be approaching the possibility of a second wave of COVID-19? You spoke about the schools shutting down, for example, are there other measures that are being undertaken to insulate against the possibility of a second wave? So I think the, um, the challenges are probably twofold. One is the um, sort of, you know, importation of cases um, from countries where, uh, you know, the outbreaks, of course, in a more advanced um, stage. And that's something that um, unfortunately we had to deal with because uh, um, you know Singapore residents were returning from many countries across the world uh, where COVID nineteen outbreaks were um, were increasing. So um, those returning um, individuals had seeded um, this sort of second wave of transmission that we have to deal with at the moment. Um, since then, because we now um, we we now know a lot more about the epidemiology and the spread of disease. Um, in different countries, uh, we have actually put in place a uh, mandatory 14-day um, stay-at-home notice um, for all travelers um, from anywhere across the world coming um, to Singapore. And, and they would then um, have to basically remain in their place of residence or hotel for 14 days and not be in contact with anyone. So with that, um, with the recent returnees, we had actually reduced the... Uh, um, sort of um, spread of COVID-19 quite substantially. But of course, we have to deal with this, as you mentioned, second wave of, uh, of community um, transmissions. And what we've done is to increase um, progressively, you know, suite of measures. Um, and, and all of this, like I mentioned earlier, is part of, um, you know, sort of anticipating any future um, increases in cases, but also to do something to bring the number of cases down so that we would be able to balance between uh, some of these sort of, I, I guess, higher uh, intensity measures and, and to bring it down and, and then we can move back more to, uh, you know, live as, as uh, usual as much as possible. So we try to, to, to do the set of measures that we think are more pro are most appropriate for um, that time in point, uh, point in time, rather than trying to roll out things too early, um, because then you might have to hold them for a really long time with, with huge, um, social economic uh, impact or to do it too late and then the health impact would be you know uh, very high because the outbreak can quickly go out of control so it's this balance fine balance that we're trying to reach so it includes things for example we're doing now like uh, um, having home-based learning for um, school children uh, to uh, encourage people to telecommute as much as possible so that we can reduce um, community interactions and to ask people uh, especially uh, those from the uh, vulnerable um, groups, um, you know, the elderly, those with comorbid medical conditions, to stay at home as much as uh, as possible. So, so all these measures we hope will be able to bring um, the reproductive number low enough so that we can really reduce cases in the next coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Turning to Dr. Shibuya. Uh, we heard and we have uh, heard in a number of media reports as well as uh, most recently in Dr. Zhang's presentation about the vulnerability of the elderly to COVID-19. Japan, like other countries that have been hard hit by this virus, has a very large elderly population. 
what measures has Japan undertaken to look after the health of this significant segment of the population and how have they been so effective? So you have so right. Uh, so as we have, uh, we are the one of the, Japan is one of the, you know, most aging society as Italy. So Japan is fully aware of the risk of the uh, large number of potential severe cases. So all the hospitals, particularly intensive care unit, and also nursing care home are the places uh, the government has always already informed the potential spread of the uh, coronavirus and also some measures. But I think we are still lagging behind in terms of preparedness. And obviously right now, given this current potential surge of uh, the infection, uh, you know, all the municipality government, prefecture government are uh, working around the clock to prepare for the next phase. And in terms of effectiveness, we are not quite sure at this stage because everything is a little bit chaotic. And the fundamental problem right now is the lack of uh, proper communication, coordination, not just across the agency, but also between the expert and policymakers. Uh, it's becoming really tricky and at the beginning because we had our Tokyo Olympics. And uh, so the policymaker like to you know, keep the things calm down and also they didn't want to share bad information. And also they wanted to show off that they're doing you know, you know, as much as they can, uh, put aside all the technical and scientific evidence. But now you know, we see the potential explosion and including myself, lots of experts are warning the government, but you know, still the government is very slow to act. So, and also that affects the public perception about this um, extent of pandemic. So all these factors are now becoming very, very complicated. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shuelan, if I may, I'd like to ask, uh, a question or two of you. Uh, I have heard from others, not from you, that you've been invited in the past to brief the Chinese leadership on public health issues. Prior to the outbreak of COVID-19 in Wuhan, how prominent of an issue was pandemic control on the minds of China's leaders? And what concerns were foremost uh, in consideration in Beijing? Well, actually, uh, uh, I was indeed, I think last November, uh, I uh, did, uh, you know, gave a talk at the uh, Central Polybureau's uh, study session on emergency management, not on um, public health per se. Uh, you know, in, in talking about emergency management, we have four major kind of emergencies that uh, was listed in, in terms of when we talk about the emergency management. Public health is one of the four kinds. So I think that the uh, government, the leaders do pay attention to how to build a strong and robust uh, national uh, emergency management system, uh, including uh, one uh, you know, um, responding to public health events. Uh, so I think that the, in general, I think the, you know, I think uh, after China's, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, SARS in 2003, the uh, national leadership has indeed been paying great attention to uh, address, you know, public health uh, issue, uh, you know, events like this one. So I think in in uh, um, in in uh, uh, you know 2009 when there's H1N1 and I think China did respond it very uh, uh, very quickly. This time also I think that um, the response uh, you know once the problem is recognized the response was very uh, decisive and very quick. Uh, but I think the challenge is how do you recognize the problem early enough? That's the challenge. Thank you. And can I just pick up on that thread? Because there's been a lot of uh, discussion and focus about the issue of transparency, and you raised it in, in your comments as well. It's a, it's a difficult challenge. Um, what, what do you anticipate will be the, the corrective measures taken to increase and enhance transparency at the onset of outbreaks in the future? And related to that, um, China has not uh, publicly recorded asymptomatic patients until April 1st. Um, why, why did China make that decision uh, not to publicly record those cases? Okay, let me uh, respond to the first one first. 
uh, I think the here, I think the the um, question is not uh, simply a transparency problem. I think this time again, I think you know, uh, it's a it's a novel sort of virus, and I think uh, when it first appeared, it's very difficult to recognize its behavior and to understand its behavior. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, wherever it happens, you know, to appear, I think that you know process is going to be challenging. Uh, and here, I think that uh, if you look at the whole, I think now. In China, there's a lot of, you know, there's kind of reporting, uh, you really outlining the whole sequence. You see that actually the local health authority indeed actually, uh, uh, you know, announced publicly about the, you know, appearance of so-called the, uh, you know, unknown uh, pneumonia. So I think the, you know, that itself is not, uh, you know, um, where they're trying to cover up. But I think the, there was it certainly, I think there's, um, there seems to be efforts by the local government to downplay uh, the uh, significance of the event. And also to, uh, you know, uh, I, I think they've also, uh, because of that downplay, uh, led to the sort of, in a way, the uh, wrong judgment about the behavior of the virus. So I think that, uh, but I, I, as you can see that as soon as the, you know, the behavior of the, the virus was recognized I think actually there was very quickly a uh, quick movement of the uh, the national health authority to report, you know, to the general public about the uh, the behavior. I mean, about the cases of the virus. I think on the second issue, um, I think actually uh, if you check carefully of the uh, the January the twenty eighth, I think there is a third edition of China's. You know, so the containment, the plan, you know, of the COVID-19, uh, they were already actually, uh, they were, you know, in a way, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, including the sort of uh, asymptomatic uh, sort of cases in that plan. And so basically there was already, you know, being covered by that uh, containment plan. And I think they're very um, careful sort of uh, uh, cases, how do you treat those, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, cases, so I, I I don't think there's any sort of intentional, uh, you know, sort of in a way sort of cover up on those cases. I think actually those cases were indeed you know covered in that uh, edition. There were already indeed you know they were found. Uh, there were cases that you know people were infected, but there was no symptom. So in, if you uh, read the, the 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 control plan of the January to 28th, and that was already notified and also that, you know, was um, measures being taken. However, that was indeed was not separated from other, you know, sort of cases that being observed or being quarantined. I think now given that there's so, so, so much, you know, discussion and, in, in, and public's concern. So I think now on April the 1st, uh, you know, the government began to, you know, take that group in as a separate group. But again, you know, there was, you know, not any, nothing new, but it was just from the previously, you know, quarantined cases and, you know, this taking them as a separate group. So I, I think that uh, uh, people, if people read the, uh, the version uh, three, uh, that should be quite clear. Thank you, Dr. Shui. No. Dr. Zhang, if I may ask uh, you a question. Um, as, as Shui Lan was just noting, this has been a novel experience. We've been learning a lot as we've been uh, dealing with, with this crisis, both in China and Asia and around the world. Uh, as a medical professional and practitioner, what if we learned about protecting medical personnel dealing with this virus since the outbreak in Wuhan? Uh, 我们现在面对的是一个新型的病毒 
So previously there were about uh, 386 teams of medical professionals and in total about 40,000 medical professionals uh, fighting against the virus in Hubei. 到目前的已经撤回了三万多名队员，将近四万名队员已经撤回了。And uh, close to forty thousand, uh, about more than uh, thirty thousand, close to forty thousand of these uh, medical professionals uh, have returned uh, to their homes. 目前得到的数据呢，是有数据呢，是医务人员员额的医疗队没有一个人感染。So the current figure shows that. Out of these uh, 40,000 medical workers who went to help uh, Hubei province, uh, the uh, infection rate was zero. 据我所知的话呢, 只有一名医务人员车祸牺牲, well, according to my knowledge, uh, one healthcare worker uh, unfortunately died from a car accident. Uh, one suffered from a heart attack due to long hours of labor, but currently under treatment. And another one suffered from a cerebral vascular accident and now is under recovery. Thank you. And if I may... Okay. Well, and of course, uh, among the frontline healthcare workers, um, common medical problems in respiratory systems, uh, digestive system, cardiovascular system do occur. So I would like to share our experiences of how do we achieve the number zero. I hope our experiences can be helpful to others. 我们将医疗队分成了医疗组、护理组、后勤组、这控组、检验组、院感组和心理指导组、宣传组等八个小组，并建立了医疗队的管理制度和队员的守则。So we split the medical team up into several groups, including a treatment group, a nursing group, a quality control group, a testing group, a hospital infection control group. Uh, a psychological consulting group and a publicity group, uh, in total about eight groups. And we established a medical management system and also a code of conduct for all team members. We the uh, so the, the system we uh, established includes a code of conduct, a hospital infection management system, a medical resource distribution and application rules, um, and public launch and space management system, uh, and the destination hotel protection and prevention rules, uh, cell phone and mobile device usage rules, so all in all about six sets of rules and regulations. <laughs> 我们还制定了一套针对职业暴露的预案，例如砸针时护士拿到自己的手指，防护衣被勾破了，防护衣不小心污染等意外的突发情况，该如何的处理？So we've also uh, we've always focused on how do we pre pre prevent uh, infection uh, among our healthcare workers. So we have also made a set of contingency plans for occupational exposure. Uh, such as what happens when a nurse accidentally punctures, punctures herself uh, during an injection, uh, what happens when the protection gown is damaged, uh, what happens when there is contamination when someone is taking off the protection gown, uh, and so on. Great. Thank you very much for sharing those insights with us. Uh, given the the shortening time that we have together and the abundance of questions that we've received from around the world. I'd like to now turn to a few questions from the public. Uh, we will start out with a question from Mark in Washington, DC. Uh, the question is uh, directed at uh, Dr. Kwan, but others are welcome to jump in from, uh, particularly from a Japanese or Singapore perspective. Um, but after the Infectious disease management law in January or February was put in place. Was there a sunset period for when the law would uh, be revoked? 
Are there limitations on what information the government can collect and disseminate publicly? And how long is private information kept by the government? Dr. Kwan, why don't we start with you? And then uh, if others would like to uh, jump in, they're welcome to as well. I'm very sorry, but it, it is about uh, information. I didn't get it very clearly, the answer. I mean, the question. It's a, a question relating to the infectious disease management law and whether or not the law would have a sunset clause. So in other words, once once the disease has passed or the pandemic has passed, will the law be withdrawn? And, uh, and what are some of the practical effects of the law on information collection and privacy issues? I see. Um, I'm not, I'm sorry, but I'm not very uh, familiar with this law, but um, still, as I mentioned, there is a clash of trade-off between privacy issues and especially the collecting the information related to the tracking of, uh, of, of the context. But um, as I mentioned, uh, at the very beginning, some people raised issues of these privacy issues, but overall, I think um, people tend to accept this uh, uh, potential violation of, of privacy. And then that's, that's my very brief, uh, brief answer, but I'm not sure whether I get the, the, the question very correctly, sorry. Okay. And okay. also, you know, another very uh, important uh, information source is that we have a national health insurance covering everybody. So whoever uh, used the, the healthcare uh, visited clinics or hospitals or even pharmacy, most of the informations are, are all collected by the one single payer, national health insurance system. So even that information is quite extensively used in, in the tracing of context. So there is another very important information source, single payer covering everybody. Th thank you. Uh, our next question is from Yushuan in the University of Oxford for Dr. Lee in Singapore. The Singapore government indicated recently that when the virus containment reaches a better situation, border control measures may be relaxed. Uh, what factors are currently under consideration that would drive a determination on relaxation of border control measures? Sure, I think um, you know, that will depend on uh, several factors which we have to take in, in as a whole. Of course, is you know, what the sort of global situation um, is like and, and what the situation in um, perhaps specific countries where uh, we would want to relax those measures might be. And, and that would include um, things like, you know, how comprehensive um, 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 surveillance systems are, what is the uh, overall number of cases and the trajectory of the outbreak, um, both in Singapore and, and in the respective uh, um, countries. Uh, but I think that is something that we would have to consider so that, you know, that there is, um, you know, an end, uh, stage to this this whole um, sort of containment efforts because I think right now a lot of governments um, and, and and international organizations alike are looking at when you know these containment measures will end and how they will end and I think even within countries like I'm, um, I think earlier earlier question about you know how long these measures will be put in place uh, I think most governments at the moment including Singapore uh, when we come out with a measure, we will say we will put it in place for a certain duration. And, and typically we will say, you know, I think two incubation periods or, or about 28 days to a month is a reasonable period where we, then we can then observe um, whether there is any um, impact of those measures and then we can adjust accordingly. I think it needs to be um, something that's uh, in a way um, time bound or time limited. Um, and then you can consider uh, adjustments because if you leave it, you know, totally open-ended, the danger is that um, there's always a risk that you would keep it for longer than it, it, they are necessary. So, so I think these are some of the factors that we would consider. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, I have a question from Hannah for Dr. Shibuya. The question is, uh, why has the number of cases and mortality rate in Japan been so low relative to other countries? 
especially in spite of the lack of preventive measures that have been instituted by the government? So first of all, as I said earlier, um, we fo Japan focused on the targeting clusters of infected people at the beginning of our control measure, and which has been successful. So, and also the other flip side of the coin is that we didn't do aggressively in terms of testing, expand testing capacity. So both contributed to a relatively low number of cases up to uh, now. But now in Tokyo and the big cities like Osaka, we see the rapid increase in number of reported cases. So we now see, we predicted there would be an explosion uh, and we, we are in, in entering the second phase of this pandemic situation. In terms of number of deaths, um, because we have so many pneumonia deaths, so there will be misclassification, but also we are still, we were in the early stage of this outbreak. So we will see more potential casualty in due course. Thank you. I have a question from Dr. Francis Liu. Uh, I will direct it to Dr. Shuelan and Dr. Jung. Uh, it's a question about face masks and, and wearing them. And I know that Shreylan, you, you spoke about this as well as Dr. Kwan. This is a subject of some debate in the United States, whether there should be um, more encouragement or instruction for people to wear face masks. How critical has the use of face masks been? And um, should there be more pressure on the general public to wear face masks in public? Okay. Let me first say a few words. I think then, of course, Dr. Zheng probably is more authoritative in, in, on, on this issue. Uh, I think, first of all, I think that uh, based on the findings so far, I think there seems to be, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, face masks would be very helpful in, in terms of, you know, preventing getting infected uh, in, in sort of closed, uh, you know, sort of spaces like in, in elevator or in, in, you know, crowded places and so on. So that actually, I think certainly, I think given what's been known, that should be useful. But at the same time, if you are in a very, in a park, open space at a park, uh, that uh, may not be as necessary. That's my understanding uh, based on what I see. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Zhang can, uh, can also tell us more. Thank you. Uh,周院长,周院长您好,呃,下面一个问题是给您的,呃,就是说呢,想让您跟大家谈一谈,呃,您认为在口罩, uh, 作为一种公众的防护的方法所以目前认为还是从呼吸道传染为主的一个疾病 So according to our knowledge of the uh, uh, COVID-19 so far, it is a respiratory disease. And according to the results of the autopsies, uh, the major damage to the human body was to uh, a person's lungs. So right now, we mostly look at it as a respiratory disease. 所以从这些... 道理来讲的话, so from these uh, conclusions we've drawn so far, I believe wearing a mask uh, is a very important uh, preventive measure. 在目前的国际的疫情的情况下面, 在特别是在流行的国家里面, 大流行的国家里面, 我认为强制性的在公共场所, so according to the situation of the uh, widespread of the coronavirus internationally, and especially in the uh, countries with major outbreaks, uh, I believe it is very important that we, the government uh, should uh, put forward mandatory requirements for people to wear masks in public spaces. We believe for the general public, uh, the masks that they wear in uh, public spaces uh, should only be surgical masks and not N95 masks. We also 
，如果是疫情发生严重的地方，可能要采取更严格的措施。And we strongly suggest that we should uh try to uh decrease the amount of activity in public places as much as possible, and especially uh with uh, group activities. Uh, and also in places where the outbreak、uh, is really surging right now, maybe you need stricter rules. We still recommend putting more professional masks on those who are We also recommend that we leave the、uh, professional face masks、uh, for our frontline medical workers. That's all. Thank you very much. If I could ask one final question, we're, we're out of time, but、uh, it's a yes or no question. Uh, is there any evidence of neurological issues associated with the virus? Uh, I want to ask one final question. That is, in this virus, we have seen some evidence of neurological issues associated with the virus. Now, there is no evidence of neurological issues associated with the virus. We are just studying the material for the neurological issues. The neurological issues are not clear. But in the lab, we have seen some evidence of neurological issues associated with the virus. We have seen some evidence. 神经末梢的改变，比如说，我们有发现有短暂的病人的失明的失眠的情况，也就是眼睛看不见了。经过抗病毒治疗以后，肺部炎症减退以后，它就消失了。那么我们在判断，一是不是病毒引起的，二是不是由于血管阻塞引起的？那么目前还没有完全的明确。嗯、uh...。So in terms of its in,、uh, neurological impact,、uh, we're still finding out more evidence, and it's very hard to draw a conclusive、uh, conclusion right now.、Uh, according to our clinical evidence and also from autopsies, we we found out that it's mostly damaged the lungs, and、uh, it's very little damage to the brain tissues.、Um, and also, but also、uh, during the、uh, clinical experiences, we have found that some patients might lose their eyesight、uh, temporarily. Uh, but uh, but with the、uh, improvement of their lung function,、uh, their eyesight might improve. So we're still trying to see whether this temporary loss of eyesight is caused by virus or is caused by、uh, conglomeration in a clot in their、uh, blood vessels. We're we're still finding out. Thank you very much.、Uh, we have many more questions, and I have many more questions, but I'm afraid that、uh, we've run out of time. I want,、uh, on behalf of Of Suzanne and myself to thank you deeply for the wisdom that、uh, you've shared with us, the the perspectives, the lessons,、uh, which I hope will be beneficial not just in the United States but、uh, around the world. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague and friend Chung Lee. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.